Hi everyone, Simon Chapel here. I'm the Quit Alcohol Coach, and I'm really excited to be able to bring you another sober life story with Jake. And Jake's been sober almost 14 months, literally in a couple of days. So thanks for joining me, Jake. Great to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. Well, although I understand you've got a problem at your end and you actually can't <laughs> see <me> right now. <laughs> the the oh, jaws well. of technology. Yeah, yeah. So I obviously kind of over to you a little bit. I'd love to hear your story and you know more around you know where you were, where you are now and, and how you got there. Okay, well really um so I would say that the beginning of my drinking really um was way back in around about nineteen ninety four. Um no no sorry ninety two. So I kind of left school and I um started you know uh work experience with a kind of youth training scheme yeah and you know we'd get our weekly wage and of course as you can imagine the first thing i'd ever think of at the end of a long working week was let's go to the pub sure you know? um and it hadn't really it didn't really sort of um mean much more than just having a drink really you know it was just like a typical friday evening really um but um fast forward you know and i'd get to around about um around about the age of i'd say well i was in my 20s and that's when it started to get quite serious yeah um it became you know even then it became unmanageable at that point but um and so what was interesting was um between the ages of 28 and 30 i i actually went sober for two years Wow. Okay. Uh, and um, but it didn't really it didn't really sort of mean the same as it does now. I mean, just because um, I, you know, I in in the years since I've had a young son, and you know, and also because I feel that there's a, you know, t I haven't got as much time on my side. I feel I need to take it more seriously. So. Um, and um but so i think and then also um when my mother died i think that's when my drinking really escalated um so i then it crept up on me it was sort of it, i didn't really imagine that you know it would be such an issue and then these bit i was binge drinking but these binges would kind of get like smaller and smaller or you know the, the gaps between each drink would narrow so i would yeah, have sure. more and more more and more and uh and then i was starting to black out you know i was drinking into blackout and i was sort of losing things and i was being obnoxious with people and uh you know i was lying all the time and i was sort of like um you know um didn't know who i was waking up in bed with and all the rest of it you know um throwing up everywhere and i don't know it was just i was a complete and absolute wreck um, was that, that was through most of your 30s by the sounds of it then was it or, uh, or 30 yeah, yeah that, a lot of that through the 30s but i think it really reached a kind of pinnacle um around about the age of 40 uh, one two and three uh, i mean it, all those years it just got incrementally worse just much much worse and uh you know then i was seeing um i was seeing someone you know who became one of my child or maybe and and she would often say to me you haven't been out to drink again have you um and i would often get phone calls from her or text messages saying where are you and what are you doing and it was starting to you know trust was starting to break down a lot you know yeah um she 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 couldn't trust me she didn't know what i was doing or who i was with and whether i was lying or telling people shit that i shouldn't be telling them and all of this so sure. um but um and uh and then it was it just got i started to um yeah i started to feel um physically very sick as well and um and i wasn't eating you know i was never eating or anything um yeah. so i became really bloated in the face and i i was like a skeleton you could see my ribs and stuff yeah um so do you, would you say that that was 
a point where you started to question your drinking or had you already I, I no yeah so I questioned it and that's when I decided to go um cold turkey for two years right okay so this was back sort of in the yeah, early stages that's why, that's why I'm saying it's all over the place a little bit at the moment but I it, it was when I um it was when I went out one evening to see a friend of mine who well an old school friend who's a musician and she was performing somewhere in a kind of like burlesque type show. Yeah. And uh, suddenly all this anxiety came over me. And, uh, you know, because I hadn't seen her for a long time. And I thought, well, this is really scary. I had suddenly I had all these issues of social anxiety. And I thought, well, you know, I can go and see her. But uh, I, I'm not going to be able to see her unless I have that drink. And so I, I knew what was coming. So, I, you know... I arrived at the the venue and with a couple of mates and uh, they sent me off to the bar and I um, went round to the bar and I ordered myself two drinks and got them their drinks and before I'd came back around the corner to bring them their drinks I'd made sure that I downed the whole one pint and took the other one so it made made it look like I was only having the one. Sure, yeah, um, I've done things like that in the past. <laughs> um, and it was all of that craziness and then. Um, you know, on, on another occasion, sometime later, I was in a mate's uh, restaurant in London where I would quite often perform because that's my work. I mean, I, you know, I'm a professional musician. That's what I kind of do for a living. Right. Um, I would turn, I turned up at my mate's restaurant and, uh, I couldn't believe it. Looking back on it now, I turned up with a bottle of red wine, you know, and he, he's a, he's like a licensed, um, you know, he had a fully licensed bar. So what was I thinking, you know? Uh, I, I, the thing is, it, I can totally relate to that. I remember going on holiday to Dubai and with my son and my wife, and we were staying at a really nice hotel there. And, of course, I'd read about all the rules about alcohol in <laughs> Dubai. But, yeah, but I knew you could still buy alcohol in the hotel, but... I had this kind of fear of just what if they didn't have it. So I put, <laughs> I put two wine boxes in my suitcase. Oh, and goodness me. The worst thing was at, at the airport, there were two guys in the full kind of um, Arabic oh. robes and they were security, yeah, yeah. very scary looking security guards. And they opened my case and they saw, <laughs> these, they saw these wine boxes in there. And I thought, oh, my God, I'm going to get you know, arrested or whatever. Oh, and they, dear. They looked at me with absolute disgust, but they waved me on. They didn't do anything about it. Mm. And I totally relate to what you're saying. I used to do that. Absolutely. Just if there was the slightest, it doesn't even make sense now, does it? But, the, yeah. you know, that slightest sort of thought that, well, what if they haven't got red wine? What if they haven't absolutely. got? No, no, absolutely. And I mean, so there was all of that. And then there's another bit that I'm going to get to now, which makes it a bit more tricky for me as a drinker. So um, I've been surrounded by music my whole life, really. Um, so my sister, I know it's kind of going slightly off the point, but my sister got married to a rock musician. Right. Um, who's in a band called The Strokes. They're a big American rock band. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, they're huge. And um, so my brother-in-law plays bass in The Strokes. Really? And, yeah, yeah. And so um, they were playing in London at the Shepherd's Bush Empire. Yeah, I know it well, yeah. And uh, so we go to a gig and then we're sitting in the kind of like, you know, the record executive seats for Sony Records or whatever. Or I think it was RCA or something. But anyway, we're sat in and then after the like post show, you can imagine, we sort of we go backstage and we hang out with bands. Yeah. And again, it's another one of these classic yeah, situations yeah. where there was just alcohol everywhere. I can imagine. Yeah, probably and, more as well. Yeah, I mean, the bar was, uh, I mean, the bar was just, uh, like, prohibitively expensive. And, you know, but that's what we were doing, we pay, pay for our pints. And then we got to the end of our budget, or our budget had run out, or mine had run out anyway. And the band sort of just said, oh, don't worry, we've got a drinks table upstairs, we can bring you some more. So it was just like this, I think, this kind of thing, being around that kind of, that kind of thing and in that kind of environment may have in some way um, sort of like significantly contributed to to my drinking. Yeah, I think so. And funny enough, I was doing a, 
a live video with Janie Lee Grace yesterday, who okay. you know, she's, she's worked in the media all her life, television mm. presenter, radio presenter. Yeah. She used to be on the Steve Wright Breakfast Show. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and she's just in the in the media, and we were actually talking exactly about this: how hard it or harder it is in certain yeah. certain walks of life. Mm. You know, if you're playing playing music you know moving in circles where there's after yeah. parties that kind of thing yeah, yeah. it can be a challenge because it is there all the time it's in your face no, and it be, it, 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 i'm reminded also of an experience which is interesting because um oh why am i bloody name dropping but anyway i think it plays into my story a little bit but um so i grew up next door to the sound engineer for pink floyd Oh really? That's really weird because a friend of mine lives yeah. next door to lives next door to um, a session guitarist for Pink Floyd called Snowy yeah. White. And oh, uh, okay. I've heard of Snowy White because um, David Gilmore told me about Snowy White. But yeah, yeah, what a coincidence. Anyway, yeah, go on. And uh, I, I'll, I'll never forget this. I so I um, I was at Earl's Court in London in '94, I think, and. Uh, I saw the band anyway, and my neighbour was mixing the show. Um, so it was it was just at the end of the sort of world tour for an album called um, The Division Bell. Yeah, I know it. And so they'd just come back from the world. And um, and anyway, so saw the show, and it was all fantastic, you know, uh, sort of multi-sensory and all of this, you know, all the lights they do. And then we get to the end, and we go and, I go and see the band after the show. And uh, of course, I'd been drinking quite a lot already, you know. Yeah. And anyway, so I got backstage, and the first thing David Gilmore said to me before anything else was, "I don't think you need any more booze." Really? <laughs> <laughs> like that? Talk about a wake-up call. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just reminded of this. I don't know why. I was just thinking about this a little bit today. Yeah. Maybe, and uh, maybe you thought you were comfortably numb. <laughs> oh that's classic yeah so, but he yeah so he even he maybe observed something in me but i mean you know i i looked younger than my age anyway at that point um right. but um but yeah no i think so there have been various things and i think obviously it's ran in my family because my father for one was a very heavy drinker so um, you know, but he hasn't had a drop since 1985. Wow, that's brilliant. So he's got a lot of sober time. And he, if anything, he's become the opposite extreme of what he used to be. So he used to live for drink and now he's uh, he's anything. But no, no, don't have a drink. You know, that's don't incredible. ever go near a drink. So, yeah. You know, and in uh, 1985 as well, the the yeah. sort of level of support really. You had Alcoholics Anonymous rehab, or you just kind of you know white knuckle it and yeah, deal. exactly. There wasn't yeah. a lot. No. I imagine there were some books and things like that, but yeah, you know, absolutely. Um, but just bear with me. I'm going to come back to the camera, but there's something I want to get quickly. Yeah, for sure. So um, I was really happy um, to get this very important book. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that's good. That's a great book. Um, <laughs> one of the best. I don't know who wrote it, but I think he's quite a nice guy. Yeah, I, I've heard. He's one of the uh, the great sober authors. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, but yeah, so that, that, that offered me some very interesting advice, you know, particularly with um, the kind of jitters that I get from time to time. In relation um, to anxiety? Anxiety and where the the urges and the crutches come in to maybe relapse or something, which yeah. you know has been part of my story, my journey. I think there was a reference to sort of just playing around with like a rubber band to just release your stress. Yeah, I think you remember there might have been that piece of advice in there, so it was quite good. Um, but something I've significantly noticed recently um, is how I'm much more aware of my emotions. So you know, um, I acknowledge them more. I, you know, I'm, whenever I was drinking, actively drinking, I was always wanting to chase the high. You know, I could never yeah. be anything but high. Um, it, the moment I got low, then I thought, right, I have to get a drink because I don't want to feel like this. Absolutely. 
I just have to feel high all the time and I have to impress everyone and it's really important and I have to be the best shot in town, you know. Um, it's interesting you say a couple of those things because, um, again, yeah. it sounds very similar to the, the way that I used to be. I used yeah. to think I was a complete extrovert. Uh, yeah. Rather like you, I was always wanting to impress people. Yeah. I, was, I was very much a people pleaser. Yeah. And then yeah. since I've quit, absolutely there's this it felt like a suit like i had a suit of armor on which was out yeah, yeah. and it feels like the suit of armor's gone and at first you feel kind of naked and exposed and yeah, you know, yeah. vulnerable yeah, yeah absolutely and it's an but it's also an amazing feeling because you get mm. to find and discover this new person who you never mm. really knew and i it turns out i actually wasn't i wasn't an extrovert i'm a bit of an introvert <laughs> Who knew? Yeah, who knew? Yeah. I mean, so the, the the other thing that made me really nervous, and I'm going to go back to the rock music, only because it has really been a lot of my story, I feel, in some ways, you know? Yeah, it's obviously a big part of your life. Um, I've been around rock music and musicians a lot of my life. And, um, um, so I remember when I went to see the Foo Fighters. Oh, a favourite band of mine. Well, in fact, it was the Strokes, but the Foo Fighters, no, the Strokes was supporting the Foo Fighters. But, um, and uh, I remember then I went backstage for that and there's David Grohl right there. That's and incredible. I can't, but it's funny this because two out of, two out of the last three Sober Live stories I've done, the, you and a guy called Rob Warman, who's a This Naked Mind coach, he's really right. awesome. He went backstage at a Foo Fighters gig and he's, he's, he sent me a photo of him with Dave Grohl and Dave Grohl's daughter, I think. Yeah, right. Why do I not get these chances? Anyway, yeah, tell I me. No, exactly. But I just got absolutely hammered that, yeah. that time. I got absolutely hammered. Um, and then, you know, just because it's, it's another situation where you kind of feel nervous. But interestingly, the last time the Strokes played in Britain, um, in Victoria Park, which is kind of like in East London. Yeah, I know it. Um, I wasn't invited. My sister didn't invite me. And um, initially, I was very, very pissed off. I thought, well, how is it that you can invite all my brothers and then you exclude me? Well, in fact, the way I see it now is she was doing me a favor because um, I had such serious drink issues that she was just, you know, she was looking out for me, really. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, you you can't come to the show and it's only because of the drink. Yeah. yeah. And especially somewhere like Victoria Park in East London after yeah. dark, if you're having, if you were having blackouts, things like that, you yeah. know, I remember, I remember being at Glastonbury one year and I was, you know, blind drunk, tripping over tents, couldn't, didn't know where I was going. It just, oh, God. yeah, so, no, no. absolutely. So but, talk, tell, how did you said like age 40, one, two, three was where you kind of really realized that things needed to change or something wasn't right. Where, when did that yeah. go from a point of being aware you had a problem into actually taking action? And what action did you take? Um, well, okay, so I got to, I got to 42 and I realized, well, no, it was 43 eventually. I mean, I'll probably go from that point. I mean, Okay, around about the age of 41, 42, I think when my mum died, which was in 2014, yeah, it was 2014 when mum passed on, it was at that point that my drinking really started to take on a life of its own. Um, and, um, you know, because I just wanted to shut out all my emotions because I was just numb already as it was from her passing. I imagine. Um, but, uh, and then... And then I, I, um, it was helpful though, because the BBC sort of filmed her at home and it was on national broadcast for, you know, a few minutes. Um, so it was nice to see those last little nuggets of her life, but, um, but that's where it really escalated. And I was going from like, just having a few pints in the pub to then having like eight, nine, 10 pints. Yeah. Um, and then towards the very end, I was isolating in my flat and just drinking on my own. And even then when guests came round, I'd be hiding the alcohol in the cupboards so that they didn't think that I was having a lot, you know. And I'd be going from one off license to another one and just not wanting to be known by anyone, yeah. you know. 
So they don't um, say to you, isn't that the third bottle that you know, you've had today? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Um, but just to put it into context, the perspective, I mean, at the, the very last bin, when I had uh, 10 pints, uh, two bottles of red wine and a bottle of champagne. Yeah, and when you think of it like that, you know, I imagine the hangover was pretty awful. And oh, I thought have... I was going to have a hangover for maybe just like a couple of days, but no, you know, who was kidding? I had a hangover for a stonking five days, um, and I was just... I th that that really, if I'm honest, I mean that was the point at which I thought, right, this is not, you know, this, you know, something has to change here. Yeah, see, for me, for me, that moment was I remember sitting at my desk, typing on my computer, my hands were shaking and they wouldn't stop, and yeah. it happened the next day again, and I thought this is affecting my health. Uh, it's take, yeah. it's got complete control of my life. Yeah, I've got to do something, yeah. and that was yeah. when I just took a small step forward and picked up a book and started just yeah. educating myself. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, the other thing was that I, you know, I used to play, in a, I used to do a residency slot or show in central London in like a blues bar just behind Hamdy's, just sort of around the corner from Carnaby Street. Yeah. Um, you know, and so I was playing with a swing band, so we were doing like 1940s, 1950s, bebop, jazz, and all kinds of interesting yeah, yeah. But um, what would happen is I'd get paid to do that, gig, and I'd also get free alcohol. So, right. be like on tap, oh yeah, no, you, of course you can have another if you like. Um, and then there was a point where you know because I was a bit of a womanizer anyway, I'd like, or you know, I'd love my female friends. I had a few that would come down to watch me at the show, and of course I thought, oh well, if they're giving me free pints, then I can just get free drinks for the girls as well. Sure, which is going to make you more popular. Yeah, and if you're like, oh, he's a nice guy, yeah, he's, he drinks in. So it's like, oh, yeah, well, I've got three girls here and they're all watching me and I'm, it's pumping my ego and it's all very good. Um, and um, But then, um, yeah, they, it came to a point where the band just kind of, well, they kind of sacked me, really. <laughs> they didn't even really say it. They didn't explicitly tell me that I... They didn't want to play with me. They, and it made me think. Well, I think I have an issue with drink because they're not telling me, and some people won't tell you if it's a drink problem. That's right. They don't. They don't say anything, but, 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 but um, they'll just look at you, um, you know, in shame almost. But um, I was so oblivious to everything that was going on around me that I really didn't even have any idea what they might be thinking, and probably didn't even care actually. Isn't it crazy? You just made me think as well how, because nobody ever said to me that you've got a problem with your drinking, yet mm. there's that moment where you're funny, everyone thinks you're hilarious, and it, yeah. maybe sometimes you think you're hilarious. Yeah. But yeah, there's, exactly. that moment, yeah, there's that moment, though, where it's okay, and then it tips mm. over onto being not okay, and people start to kind of, yet this is the drug that is the only one that you have to justify not taking. You know, if you were sat there sticking heroin in your arm, I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> would say something. But yeah. they don't. They don't. It, it's, it's, a, it's so funny, the sort of social no, acceptabilities know. around alcohol. Um, and so it was. It all, it all came to an end. I remember we did a few shows in Reading down in Surrey. Um, and then we did some in London and we got to, it got to the October of 2018. Yeah. And he said, I'll call you next week to see what we can do in the next couple of weeks with gigs and stuff. And, uh, next week arrived and no call the following week arrived and still no call. And then, um, then I got this message. And he sort of said, I think, it, you know, it's time up. We've got to move on. And I'm sorry, but we can't be using you anymore. Yeah, right. that's a bit of a blow. And I thought, oh, God, that's really, that sucks. But And then when I spoke with it, I gave it quite a bit of time before I was then in communication with him again. And then, then when I asked him why, he said, well, because you were too drunk and you were always playing too loud. <laughs> yeah. The two go hand in hand. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then recently, uh, probably about a month, maybe two months ago, I decided to be brave enough to go back to the bar where we used to play in central London. 
That's really cool. How did that go? I well, I went along with a strategy before I even set off on the journey. I thought, right, I've got some idea of what's going to happen. I'm going to go to the bar and I'm going to stay for one set. Right. I turned up at the bar. I didn't. I only spoke to the saxophone player. He was the only guy that knew I was coming. I didn't want the others to know because I thought I wanted it to be a surprise. So I turned up, and um, the guitarist who was the like the main guy really in the band sort of had his back turned to me. They were sort of tuning up, setting the equipment up, and he turned around and he said, "Oh my goodness, it's you! How are you doing? I haven't seen you in ages. Happy New Year!" And um, and I just stayed there for a coke and uh, watched their set. Was really impressed with it. Seemed quite convivial and like friendly with them. And then just pushed off. And uh, but there was a difference that I noticed really with me was when I used to be drinking, um, the environment was really charged and I was completely manic. It was this time the environment was still really charged, but I was the one that was a lot calmer. Yeah, it's amazing the difference it makes. I mean, I, I, and no doubt from what you've said about music and how it features in your life, you've probably been to quite a few gigs and now yeah. you're sober. I mean, for me, I remember the first gig I went to, which I, you've probably read about this in my book, and mm. I just couldn't believe the difference, the, in, the, the way I was engaged. Yeah. And, how clear it all was not the sound yeah. the vision that everything was so clear mm. and, and i could remember the set list the yeah exactly time. and even some of the day after which is unheard of for me wow and, and not to mention not going to the bar and the toilet every five minutes carrying yeah. three plastic pint cups of beer with one between my teeth oh, trying God. to fight through yeah. the crowd it was okay yeah and then I could drive home and my comfy bed awaited me rather than getting a taxi yeah. in the rain and all that. Exactly. Sort of thing. So have you been to many gigs sober? Or uh, not, not really recently. No, I don't think that actually I don't, you see, since I've got sober. I've sort of, um, just uh, been a bit more gentle on myself. I still want to right. go to gigs at some point, but um, um, following on from getting sober, I start to feel quite depressed for a long time. So, um, and it's only really, if I'm honest with you, it's only really in the last week that I've come out of it. And I, I've right. been depressed since uh, March 2018. Okay. But I, when I then decided to stop drinking, I became even more depressed. Um, and I don't know, I think, I think that the drink really, I mean, it partly had something to do with it, but I think it was just something that was already kind of there. It was a pre-existing kind of like condition. That's what I was just going to say. You probably uh, find. I mean, I, I've discovered yeah. since I quit that I actually um, have ADHD, and I never knew. Right. It was it was when yeah. I took off that suit of armor that I was able to get clarity on certain yeah, sure, mental sure. health issues. So you yeah. might find that you, without even knowing it, you were drinking exactly, to yeah, not it all out. I think the other thing is that my ex my ex partner used to work for a huge show called Stomp, which is all over the world. Yes, I've heard of it. Um, so she was a lighting um, like operator for the London stage show of Stump. And um, what would happen is they were all a great cast, you know, the cast in the show. They're all fantastic, really fit, really like athletic and really strong. Yeah. But they always loved the pub after the show. Of course they did, you know. So we'd all fall into the pub around the corner from the theatre. And there was one occasion where I remember a member of the cast was leaving the show. And the director of the show came into the pub and put two grand down on the bar. It's like, what? Um, so we were really on it then. Yeah. Well, I bet. Well, it's just meant, in fact, I had, I think I went a little extra further and got like, had 15 pints in the end. Yeah. Which you tend to do, you know, when you, if you're like me and you've got no off switch, that's what yeah. happens. Yeah. It's crazy. Uh, so just, go, I, I, just going back to your, the depression side yeah. of things. You said obviously that came really kind of came to light after you quit. And for anyone yeah. watching, a lot of people, you know, who watch this might have found that after they've quit, they've experienced actually like pink clouds, a sense of euphoria. Yeah. Did you get that, or did you? Yes, I did have. Uh, I did have pink clouds more recently, though. I had pink clouds. I would say from around about um, sort of really into the new year now. So in the last few months, I've had more pink clouds. I mean, but what I was sort of just saying, 
you know, before about acknowledging the, you know, the kind of like the emotional processes and being like aware of like the highs and the lows. Um, I think I was able able to um, notice them and kind of not like allow them to sort of um, completely like just take over my life. So I've had probably more of the pink clouds than I have of the like the depressive moments. But um, and the pink clouds have been amazing. But when these moments kind of subside, that's when I kind of like um, always feel a bit shaky and like naked, like you were saying before, when you first stop drinking, you sort of almost don't know who you are. You know, you think, well, who am I now? Um, because it, it had always defined your life. It had always it had given you a sense of identity. And this is what's been a huge struggle for me is, although I had work, I mean, now obviously I'm not working because of what's going on, but yeah. um, but it gave me that identity. Um, and uh, then I think to myself, well, this is funny. Perhaps I never had an identity anyway. That's a very interesting point. You know, and equally, you know, I think now the sober life to a degree is my identity. I don't want not drinking to define me as a person yeah uh, it's yeah. You know, i don't know if you've ever seen the video i did called why we should think like vegans but it's all about how well, so when my belief is that quitting alcohol and being sober is very much a lifestyle choice mm, mm. and i'm so passionate about it i love yeah. everything that comes with it yeah, and it's sure. a wonderful journey of self-discovery it's not just putting the glass down and never having a drink again there's so much no. more to it emotions etc and the reason i've i've termed the phrase liquid vegan is because when you look at someone who's vegan they are so passionate about the lifestyle they've chosen mm. for themselves they're not crying because they can't have no, meat exactly. they can't have dairy so i've even, even one of the ladies i coach with with has made me some liquid vegan bracelets and a lot of people oh, have kind on. of latched onto the the phrase and it's so true what you're saying cool. um and i just want to say some really positive things as well really in terms of like be sober i, I really take my hat off to the be sober community and to the work that you do you know, the wonderful tireless work that you do for so many people who are suffering out there, you know, who, who obviously want to have a better quality of life for not drinking and all of this. Yeah, but oh, thanks. It means a lot. Really, really good people like uh, in the Be Sober community. And you can include this in the final, <laughs> um, you know, or when it goes out live or whatever. But, you know, um, I really, um, I've made some great friends with um, Heather Truman, uh, Martha Campbell, yeah. and um, Paul Bussier. Yeah, um, they're all amazing, awesome people. Yeah, and also another guy called Doug Gellick, who I've really got along with. So, um, those are like, well, also, sorry. Yeah, it's an amazing community. And, you know, when I, when I quit, I, I made the mistake, and I always call it a mistake and re advise other people <laughs> not to do it, of, telling the entire world I'd quit drinking after <laughs> only, only a week or two. and uh, well, Yes, I know that one. And I, I think it was probably the ADHD mm. I never knew about oh, kind yes. of sp spurred me on to be like, well, I can't just – it's a bit mm. like you said earlier, you have to be the big shot with everything. And I, I used to be a bit like that. I thought, I can't just quit. I've got to start a group. I've got to yeah. do this, do that. Well, I, 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 was, I always found it really, really – difficult because um because i'm like music as well i mean i'm professional but i play in care facilities for people with alzheimer's and dementia and things like that but um i always found it really tricky like with having a brother-in-law in a in a celebrated huge american rock band yes and i always thought well that's something that i want to live up to and or like i've got you know the the bar risen significantly for all that because then i thought well look at him why can't i be doing that <laughs> yeah and it's challenging because i think there has to be a sense of acceptance and being comfortable with who you are yeah exactly and um i remember when i was backstage at shepherd's bush empire and i met a guy like um one of the members fabrizio moretti he's the drummer in the strokes and the first thing he asked me um because i'm the drummer for many years now he so the first thing he asked me was, oh, yeah, so so when did you start drumming then? And I said, oh, well, you know, when I, I started when I was like five. And he said, oh, well, that's that's the age I started at. 
So I turned around and looked at him and I said, you lucky bastard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, I mean, you know, but um, it's it's like you sort of like the way I think about it now, it's just enjoying life, appreciating it for what it is, as you were sort of saying, and, and just accepting myself for who I am, really, without having to sort of prove that I'm someone or not. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I spent a lot of my life believing that success and happiness represented a flasher car, a bigger house, yeah. more money in the bank. And I just spent years chasing that, building my business, working all hours God sent just to make more money. Yet yeah. my sober journey absolutely taught me that that's mm -hmm. actually not what's important to me. I, yeah, sure. What, you know, I, I've realized that I get so much more out of helping other people, feeling appreciated, sharing, being vulnerable, just so much more. And, you know, it's worth more than, you know, yes, we need money. We need food on the table and yeah. heat and a house, but it, uh, we don't have to be forever chasing the next big thing. And yeah, exactly. That kind of sort of leads me to a point, actually, that, um, in fact, it, it doesn't. It kind of does. But I, it's a lot of people say to me, you know, about me being a guy and talking very openly. You know, I've spoken on television, on radio, in the newspapers about my story. Um, Eighty percent of the Be Sober group are women. Eighty percent of my Instagram followers are women, and yeah. it is amazing to speak to another guy who's happy to share emotions stories mm. I this is the thing. there's a very important point you've just raised here because um there, i've seen one or two people on be sober who guys while we're on that you know who've kind of opened up about that kind of stuff but yeah they're far and few between and i mean yeah so it is good to get to that point and um you know um but um yeah, I, I kind of learned to do that. Um, when I first got sober, um, um, Ron Brand was in touch with me. Oh, I'm friends with Ron Brand. Uh, Russell. uh, Russell's dad, yeah. Yeah, I know him well. And he uh, he messaged me and he um, he sort of said, look, you know, if you take the, if you really want to take this seriously, then we I can help you a little bit. I've got a mate who might be able to help you out. Um, but um, that 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 route was a bit expensive, so I didn't end up doing it. Yeah, cheeky bugger! I sent him a copy of my book. He should have recommend. He should have put you in touch with me. But I'll, I'll... oh right, oh well. This was in. Um, I don't know when the book. This was. Um, this would have been around February two thousand nineteen. Was the book out or? Uh, the book came out September, so probably not actually. I'll, oh, I'll yeah. let him off. I'll let him off. <laughs> Well, he, he, um, he, yeah, so he was in touch, but uh, he put me in touch with a guy called Chris Hill. Oh, I don't know him. Who, who's an addiction counsellor and, um, you know, is also a bit similar to yourself that he's working in media and sort of right across television, BBC, all sorts of stuff, you know. Oh, cool. I'll have to check him out. Um, and he seems like a really interesting guy or a nice guy, but he's in the kind of like, he's in, in Surrey somewhere, I think, himself. Oh, not yeah. far from it. Yeah, because Ron Brand used to live around here. He had a house in Strawberry Hill or somewhere like that. And also in yeah, Farnham. Right. And we live about two miles from a place called Farnham. Um, which, oh, I know uh, Farnham, yeah. Yeah, yeah and he used, he used to have an apartment there. So we used to bump into him on nights out and stuff like that. Um, he always had a bodyguard with him called Nick. But that's another story. Uh, <laughs> who I bumped into the other day, or a few couple of weeks ago, actually. So um, anyway, bye bye. <laughs> so... Yeah, men, guys talking openly. So, one, yeah. of, I get asked a question sometimes when I'm doing live Q and A's, and I, I wonder what your take on this question is actually, because mm. I sometimes struggle to answer it because I didn't do this with my own drinking, and mm. I, I kind of hesitate when people ask me it. So maybe <laughs> you, you could shed some light. You may hesitate too. So I get asked from time to time by guys who. They go to the pub and the pub to them is their community. It's their yeah. friends. It's, it's where yeah. they go to connect, yeah. to laugh, to cry, to, yeah, absolutely. Whatever, to watch sports. Yeah. And the prospect of quitting drinking to them makes them feel like, well, I'm going to lose all my friends, etc. cetera. Oh, first of all, I guess, <laughs> were, you, were, you going, were you going to the pub regularly and how did you deal with that? Exactly. That Well, that nails a very... Yeah, important point. I mean, um, 
I this was one of the things if if what you're sort of saying is like I'd given up but I was still going to a pub and I was able to connect in the same way or is that what you were sort of saying yeah I mean I guess the the, the I, question, uh, yeah, yeah go on uh, yeah I, I usually get sort of asked well either I'm gonna people I think feel either I'm gonna have to give up my friends or mm. or you know how am I even gonna handle going in a pub and not drinking and it actually yeah okay very myself. interesting point um yeah, no, that's a that's a very interesting point. I mean, so I'll what happened with me is like so just about five minutes from where I live, there's a pub, and I became buddies with the landlord. We're like really close. We were not just a member of the public going in, but we were actually friends in that. Yeah, and uh, he realised I had an issue with alcohol, and so he made a deal with me, which may be a little bit daft, but he made it with me, and he sort of said. He said, I'll tell you what, you know, I'll allow you to still come into the pub, but you can't drink anymore. Really? So, yeah. So, you know, where some landlords would probably sort of say, well, no, um, you know, sure, what are you drinking? You know, he yes, he, he, was, he wasn't interested in his business um, thriving on me going in to have drink after drink after drink because he cared about me. But so I'd go in there and then um, – and then – um, so I stopped for quite a while and then he thought, oh, actually he's not so bad. We'll let him drink again. So I started drinking again and then it got really, really bad. And then he said, that's it. Can't serve you alcohol anymore. And I found it really hard because I couldn't go in there and then, um, mingle with people in the same way. I always used to feel like a bit strange. Like the odd one out. Yeah. Like the odd one out. But, um, and then I started to resent him, you know? Like, I really, Sorry. really, really started to resent him for the fact that he wouldn't let me have a drink. And I felt like, um, and then there'd be people who were drinking, like, a significant amounts, sort of telling me that I had an issue with alcohol. You're like, it just yeah. felt, it felt bloody hypocritical. But then I kind of got to a point where I thought, well, it doesn't really matter whether they've got a problem with it anymore. You know? Yeah. I think, well, what's the problem with me? Well, yeah, because it's about you. You've got to put yourself first. Um, yeah, and so I did reach that point, but then it got nasty again. And then I, um, I, um, like I'm okay today, but in the process of staying sober, there's been a lot of anger has come up. Right. There's been a lot of anger, and I, I've burnt a lot of bridges actually with quite a number of people. But um, so I'm finding that really hard because I'm having to sort of like, um forgive myself um so that i can build new relationships with people or from you know from to to people that i used to have good solid relationships with i'm having to sort of build those bridges again you know so that i can get, regain their trust or kind of get their trust back yeah I'm, I'm finding that really really hard but um and yeah and it, it can be a challenge i mean i know for me i i mean i wasn't a big pub goer i i would be happily sit at home and drink on my own every night but mm. i i realized that there were some friends where actually the whole relationship was just based around alcohol and we didn't really have much in common and yeah, you know, yeah. we drifted apart but then i've made so many new and amazing friends mm. i've quit and the relationships feel so much more honest and true yeah exactly yeah true, yeah, yeah, yeah that's good enough. um there, there was it even got to the point where it was with colleagues as well. So you know, um, there are a couple of people through my work who were like in English, really, and we'd all drink together, and life was a big party, and we'd always be getting pissed. So, and what, what I suppose what we haven't got to is the 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 bit that a lot of people are going to want to hear is actually how did you quit? What what tools did you use? Where, where... Okay, so what I started doing was I. Um, one of the first things I did, and then it got into a mess again, but one of the first things I did was tidy up my place. Yeah. So I, I, I couldn't believe it when I looked at it, but when I got rid of all the drink cans and all the bottles, um, I filled up, um, four dustbin sacks of bottles and cans. Four. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, I just couldn't, I mean, I just could not believe it. I mean, it, you know, it was quite a big task cleaning up my place because I hadn't washed any of my clothes properly in months. I hadn't eaten properly. 
Um, there were ashtrays everywhere. The curtains were closed. You know, it was disgusting. Um, was, this at, was this at the point where had you already just sort of decided you wanted to quit or you already yeah. had stopped drinking? This was at the point that I thought, right, I've got to quit. Because there were, there were moments, well, I mean, there were many, many moments where I thought, I don't want to be like this for my son. Right, yeah. Uh, if there was anything that was kind of catalytic in me kind of reaching that decision, it was my son. Yeah. And it can be thought, so, kids can be so powerful in this. Yeah. I didn't want to, um, I didn't want my son to be witness to the kind of behavior that I was exposed to as, as a result of my father's own drinking. So, you know, um, I just didn't want him to see it. There were no ifs, buts, where's or why's about it. That was that, you know, brilliant. Yeah. Uh, so I just had to call it a day. And um, so I did that and I used to, I then start like um, taking regular exercise and things like that. I started getting out for long walks, sometimes even jogging. I started yeah. eating better. Um, I started like um, reading more, you know, I'm not a very avid reader, but I would read a little bit more. Yeah. Um, um, and I start just slowing down quite a lot, you know, um, I was, always running from my own shadow. Um, and I started writing little things down as well. So, you know, um, and looking at looking at things that I'd written to try and absorb the information on the page. Yeah, that's awesome, because I, I actually found that slowing down, I totally did that. And just, mm. you know, was ob observing more, I wasn't rushing from place to place. Yeah. Um, yeah, and again, that's an ADHD tendency that kind of right. came up, and then I was able to deal with it. But did you? So did you use any? Like, is there one particular tool that yeah you, know, you would say? Well, that was really what helped me. Like for me, it was probably the book "This Naked Mind" by Annie Grace. I mean, right. That that was like a game changer for me. Or did did you just say that's it? Clean the house. I'm not drinking anymore. And then you just sort of took it as it came. Yeah, basically, that's what I've been doing. I suppose if you want to look at it that way, I've kind of been knuckling it. But I also then um, put myself forward for counselling. So I've been yeah. going for counselling. So uh, that's, sorry, go on, yeah. Um, but what I've also found out, and this is something I am going to share, because it's uh, something that I haven't exposed through um, the Soviet yet, and something I felt might be the right time to sort of shed light on, was... That I, as a result of not drinking, I then found out that I have, um, well, I mean, I've known for a while, but it's, I've been in denial about it, but I have um, a borderline personality disorder. Right. That's interesting. And, yeah. And again, you would never have discovered that yeah. if you continued drinking. Exactly. And, and so many people have, you know, these underlying kind of things going on and they yeah. subconsciously self medicating. Exactly. But um, I would say that uh, my saving grace or the one thing that saved, saved me really in all of this was the fact that luckily I'm, you know, I'm, I can play a few instruments and things. So, I mean, I think that that's really helped. Yeah, um, that must be therapeutic to it. If I could pick up a guitar and then play a song, I don't know where I'd be today. But, and also then I could write, you see. So that's a good thing. I can write poetry and things. Um, yeah. Writing. Um, which is a really nice outlet to yeah definitely and um right. when i'm on form i'm generally quite a good communicator so um that can be quite good you know um so yours yeah. is a really amazing story and yeah. different to what i often hear you know i mean everybody's st story is different but mm -hmm. it's, it's actually quite rare for somebody to say do you know what i white knuckled it and You've made a success of it, which is yeah. bloody brilliant. You know, and but what you seem to have done is you white knuckled it, and then you thought after, or correct me if I'm wrong, but after a period you thought, yep, yeah, this is going great. You're getting into it, and then you you sort of did the learning part as you mm. went through the journey, which mm. is yeah. And it's also like you just got sick and tired of it, and just said that's yeah. it, enough. I just want to. Well, I mean. What was amazing was there was a Canadian guy in Beast Over called um, Robert Pate. Yes, I know him. And I, he, I... he sent me he sent me like six books from Canada. Wow! Like, just outright, like he he paid for the whole lot. He paid for all of them, and he sent them via Amazon straight to my property here in London. 
What an amazing thing to do. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, although I will say on camera, and I'll be very candid, that like I haven't actually read any of them yet, but um, <laughs> but I, I, I have every intention of like looking at them um, yeah. You know, in the future, the only one that I've really started looking at was your book, and I haven't, you know, I haven't, I haven't read it all the way through. But it, it's given for me personally, it's probably the best book in the stack because it just very comprehensive. Well, there's um, also I wrote one of the things that a lot of people say to me is how easy it is to read. You can do that's a what I love it. about it is because it's not packed to the raft with jargon. It's no, just. Yeah, it's yeah. no, it's not all science and no, no, just, no. And so it's coming from a very kind of layman's terms, which is good. Yeah, um, and I, I purposely wanted it like that. I just yeah. thought to myself, you know, if if I was reading this book, you just want to get to the nuts and bolts of how absolutely. do I put it? Absolutely. Yeah. What do I do? Um, one of my drinking colleagues, or the colleague that I used to drink with, he sent me a, a link to my Facebook um, Messenger quite some time ago thinking I need to sort the drinking out and you wouldn't believe it one of the things he sent through to me was Annie Grace really yeah it, he said like read this there's this amazing book called The Naked Mind you ought to read it changed my life and it is a fantastic yeah. book but you do yeah. have to put some work in and it can be you know you've got to kind of commit to it and show up yeah so I mean I'm gonna yeah I'm gonna when, when I feel ready, I mean, I'm a bit of a slow mover, really, but when I get to the point, I will. Um, but I was very, um, well, I have been very grateful to be sober because I reached out um, uh, a few days before Christmas where I was just really at my lowest point, I think. Yeah. Um, I was feeling like suicidal and all of that kind oh, of stuff. Man. Okay. Um, but um, suddenly all these people got in touch. That was great. Um, that was the point at which Paul Wazir got in touch and Heather Truman. So very grateful to those two. That's awesome. And, you know, the power of that community, you know, all these people looking out for one another. Yeah. And I've just, you know, and I've just found that people in the kind of sober world, are, you know, there's no judgment. They really no, 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 they genuinely not. care. They feel like real friends. It's yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Space. And, yeah. Um, but it's amazing. Well, once this uh, this chaos that we're surrounded by at the moment passes, it'd be nice to sort of like have these events that we can meet at, you know. Yeah. So yeah, there's I mean, there's loads of good stuff going on at the moment and ways to connect. But I know what you mean. The yeah. events are just awesome. Yeah, so. you know, it's, it's kind of important. So maybe it'd be good at some point. Yeah, definitely. Well, look, Jake, thanks for joining. It's been absolutely awesome. I mean, it might be good if you've kind of if you were able to just give one piece of advice for somebody exploring the world of sobriety, thinking about quitting drinking, but not sure what to do, like what would that piece of advice be just as a final sort of finishing message? I don't know. I think I was, uh, I would, um, if I were in their position, I would kind of reach out and um, start like just joining groups like this or looking out on the net. If you can't, obviously because of what's going on at the moment to get you can't get anywhere so i would suggest that anyone that's in a struggling or new like reach out to groups like this and just get talking to people to try and change their mindset yeah absolutely i mean clearly the support of the facebook be sober community has been something massive for you which is yeah, yeah clearly to hear you know when i set it up i never ever thought how many people it would touch so to speak yeah. to you and to you know hear your story i just thank you for sharing it, it means yeah, so not much so well thanks for joining and you know hopefully we can keep connecting which i'm sure we will as we yeah definitely on our respective journeys and thanks again yeah, absolutely